to Apollo's Raven, we look into cases from all over the world and those a little closer to home. Today we're looking into the tragic murder of Sarah Payne, whose death sparked outrage and changes to child protection legislation in the UK. Sarah Evelyn Isabel Payne was born on October 13, 1991 in Walton-on-Thames, Surrey, to parents Michael and Sarah. Eight-year-old Sarah and her family are visiting her grandfather and his wife in Kingston Gorse, West Sussex on July 1st, 2000. The family had spent the day at the beach before Sarah and Michael left their children to play, as it was such a lovely evening. Sarah's last words to them were her usual, to always stay together. Sarah had been playing hide-and-seek with her two brothers, Lee and Luke, aged 13 and 11, and sister Charlotte, aged 5, in a cornfield near her father's home. After being found by Lee, he apparently bumped into Sarah, making her cry. But she calmed down and the siblings then went to the rope swing, but Sarah jumped off and started to run. Lee chased after her as she went to run out of the cornfield, but he caught up with her and told her to wait so they could get their other siblings. Their mother had always told them to stay together, but Sarah didn't wait. She had slipped through a hedge and onto the country road. Her brothers were only metres away, but their little sister had gone out of their line of sight. He saw someone speeding away in their white van when he went to see where his little sister had gone, but there was no trace of Sarah. He just assumed she had gone back to their grandparents' house. Later said of the moment, I was about 10 seconds away from catching up with Sarah, but I had to go back and get Charlotte because I couldn't leave her. After Lee got back to his grandparents, he was shocked to discover Sarah had failed to turn up there. The family started to search in the hope that Sarah had fallen, as it wasn't that little girl to not be where she said she was. Soon a huge search by police and volunteers was conducted to find the missing girl, with the story soon becoming nationwide news, with Michael and Sarah making many appeals for the safe return of their daughter. As is procedure during missing children cases, any sex offenders in the area are questioned. This included a man named Roy Whiting, who lived nearby in his seafront flat in Littlehampton, which is only five miles away from the scene of the abduction. On July 10th, police made the promising announcement that a girl matching Sarah's appearance had been seen at Nutsford Services on the M6 motorway in Cheshire on the morning after the disappearance. Three days later, the pains were warned by police to prepare for the worst and that the daughter may not be found safe and unharmed. First of all, we want to thank everyone for your support. Um, and thank God we found her now. Thank God. Thank you. We've got a job now. I must have catch this person. For what reason? For what reason would well, you do this to someone? We can't even see our daughter because it's, it's too hard. And it's not Sarah. And I don't believe that anyone should be allowed to do that to anybody. On July 17th, a farmhand came across a naked body in a shallow grave near Pulborough, West Sussex, around 15 miles from Sarah's grandfather's home. The following day, it was confirmed that the body found was that of Sarah, and a murder investigation was then launched. Three days after Sarah's body had been discovered, police found one of her shoes on a roadside in the village of Coolham, three miles from Pulborough. After being questioned for a long period of time on July 2nd, Roy Whiting was arrested by undercover police while walking to his van. He spent two days in custody, but as there was no evidence to press charges, Whiting was released on bail. During a search of his van, police found a receipt for petrol from a station not far from Coolham, which contradicted Whiting's alibi at being at a fun fair in Hove until 5.30pm and not returning home until 9.30pm on July 1st. Upon his release, Whiting was sent to stay with his father in Crawley. On July 23rd, Whiting stole a Vauxhall Nova in Crawley and was pursued in a high-speed chase with police that ended after he crashed into a parked vehicle. Whiting was arrested for dangerous driving and was eventually jailed for 22 months. After his arrest, police started to forensically examine Whiting's 1988 white Fiat van that he'd only bought on June 23rd, 2000. On February 6th, 2001, Whiting was officially charged with the abduction and murder of Sarah. The trial started on November 14th, 2001, with Whiting denying all charges. Key witnesses included Sarah's oldest brother, who had seen the scruffy-looking man with yellowish teeth when he grinned, who had waved at the siblings while driving through Kingston Grove on the evening of July 1st. He also described seeing Whiting's van speeding away with the wheels spinning and skidding, making a screeching noise. Lee Payne failed to pick Whiting out of a suspect lineup. Forensic tests on Sarah's shoe had found fibres from Whiting's van. This was the only item of Sarah's clothing to ever be found. A strand of blonde hair had also been found on a t-shirt in the van, with DNA testing establishing there being a one in a billion chance of it belonging to anyone but Sarah. There was also witnesses who saw a white van parked by the roadside, and after pulling off a track on the evening of July 1st near the site where Sarah's body had been discovered. 
The trial revealed how Whiting snatched Sarah as she left her siblings after he had clearly been watching them and threatened her with a knife before stripping the eight-year-old and assaulting her. Jurors heard how Whiting had turned his van into a moving prison, equipped with knives, rope, baby oil and plastic tie handcuffs. The pathologist told the court that Sarah had suffered a violent death, probably due to asphyxia, in a sexually motivated attack. She described how decomposition had made it impossible to say what other injuries the little girl had endured. When she was found, her naked body had dry vegetation attached to it, and her hair had come away with the roots, but her hair had contained valuable evidence linking Sarah to Whiting's van. After a four-week trial, Whiting was found guilty of the abduction of murder of Sarah and sentenced to life imprisonment. The judge branded Whiting an evil man and a cunning and glib liar. After his conviction, Whiting's other crimes were made public. Whiting had been convicted previously of abducting and indecently insulting an eight-year-old girl in Crawley in 1995 and after admitting the charges, was sentenced to four years in prison. He was released in November 1997, having only served two years and five months. He would have been out sooner had he not refused to undergo a sex offenders rehabilitation course. He was also one of the first people in Britain to go on the sex offenders registry. Whiting showed no emotion as he was sentenced, with the judge telling him, I am quite satisfied that you indecently assaulted her. As we all know, you stripped Sarah naked and you suffocated her, and you buried her and got rid of her clothes. You are indeed an evil man. What is more, you did the same thing in 1995, but that girl you mercifully did not kill. The judge then revealed a psychiatric report for the 1995 attack that Class Whiting is a high-risk repeat offender and that he had told police that he had learned his lesson from his previous conviction when questioned about Sarah initially. The judge described Sarah's murder as truly appalling, adding, You are every parent's and every grandparent's nightmare come true. You are and will remain an absolute menace to any little girl. It's one of the rare cases where I shall recommend to the appropriate authorities that you are kept in prison for the rest of your life so no further child is added to your list of victims and the lives of a third family are not ruined. After being exposed as a multiple time sex offender to children, it created an uproar from the country and calls for the government to allow the public to have access to the sex offender registry. The day after Whiting was sentenced, the Home Office commented that it wouldn't be possible as it would run the risk of paedophiles then going underground, making it harder for police to monitor and track them down and there was the concern of vigilante attacks. On November 24, 2002, Whiting was informed that he must serve a minimum of 50 years, making him ineligible for parole until 2051, meaning that he had to live until at least 92. In June 2004, it was revealed that Whiting was appealing his conviction for a reduction of at least 50 years off his sentence. On June 9, 2010, his appeal succeeded in getting him 10 years off his sentence. His legal team argued that his 50-year term was motivated by politics and intense pressure from the public and media. The new sentence means Whiting is eligible for parole in 2041, when he will be 82. Sarah Payne was present and said she was disappointed by the decision and that life should mean life. A campaign was started in July 2000 named Sarah's Law. It was spearheaded by the News of the World after the Paynes expressed their initial and correct belief that their daughter had been the victim of a sex offender. Sarah's Law proposed access to the sex offenders registry so parents could know if there were any sex offenders in their area. Sarah Payne has always maintained that if such a law had existed before her daughter's death, then Sarah's life could have been saved. A modified scheme became active in 2008, where parents can inquire about certain individuals who have access to their children. After its success, the Home Office announced it would now cover the whole of England and Wales by the spring of 2011. Sarah Payne was made a member of the Order of the British Empire MBE, in December 2008 for all her work behind Sarah's Law. She suffered a life-threatening stroke at her home in December 2011 but has recovered. With the news of the world hacking scandal making headlines, it was revealed that Sarah had been a victim, to which she refused to believe, as the newspaper had been so supportive to the Payne family. She even wrote an editorial in the final edition. Police, initially, did not believe she had been a victim, as her name had not come up in records, but investigations into one of the other victims saw personal details related to Sarah come up. The phone that had been hacked had been given to her by the editor of the newspaper at the time, Rebecca Brooks. Michael Payne suffered greatly after the loss of his daughter, seemingly never being able to truly move on. He and Sarah separated after 18 years of marriage in August 2003 and he sank into a deep depression and became an alcoholic. He was sentenced to a 16-month jail term for attacking his brother with a glass in December 2011 following a drunken argument. On October 30th, 2014, Michael was found dead at his home at the age of 45 in Maidstone, Kent, with police stating his death is not suspicious. Whiting was attacked with a razor in prison on August 4th, 2002, while fetching some hot water at Wakefield Prison. The attack left Whiting with a six-inch scar on his left cheek. It was only in the wake of this attack did Whiting finally admit to the murder of Sarah. Whiting was once again attacked by another prisoner, this time being stabbed in the eye, and yet another attack happened on November 8th, 2018, when he was stabbed by two prisoners in his cell. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you enjoyed the video. 
don't forget to like, subscribe and share with your friends. And don't forget to give us a follow on social media. We hope to see you next time.